Church, it's great to see you today. I am really excited about next Sunday, our celebration Sunday. Just to reiterate what Alex said a while ago, we're going to have our church service at 1015, very short break, and go right into our time of celebration, which will include a dinner right in here. There's going to be different things going on during our time of celebration. A mortgage burning is going to be one of those things. But uh, we're going to uh, just celebrate what God has done over the last uh, 20 years in, in helping us and enabling us to, to be where we're at right now and, and being debt free. So please, we need you to, to sign up to let us know if you're going to be here for our celebration, uh, for the dinner part in particular, because we don't want uh, RD and Mike fighting over a chicken bone or something like that. You know, we want to make sure we have enough food for everybody. That's going to be next Sunday, right in here. And so there's going to be some really neat things happening as we celebrate what God has done. And then also the core classes. Just a few weeks away, we're, we've run those already twice. We're going to have it one more time before the year's open. Some of you have, uh, before the year's over, some of you have already gone through two of them. We want you to go through all four of them before the year's over. So please sign up. Put all of that in our offering plates in the back today. Would you take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 12 this morning? 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to be talking about the body of Christ today, that membership matters. As you turn over there, let me tell you about uh, the, the guy's name. He, he was Jake. And, and Jake was a faithful provider and a hard worker for his family for, for 40 years. And then Jake retired. And he didn't know what to do with himself. Some of you guys that are retired, maybe you're there right now, you know. And he, he just sort of kicked back. And he was really well, kind of a nuisance around the house to his wife. He sat around the house all day long in the recliner, remote control in his hand. He was just channel surfing all the time and that little lazy boy. And he's watching one of those medical shows one day. And he turns to his wife and he says, honey... I don't ever want to become dependent on some machine just lying around and in some vegetative state. If that ever happens to me, I want, you to, I want you to pull the plug, pull the plug. And she said, okay. And with that, she grabbed the remote out of his hand, smashed it on the floor, stepped on it, and then promptly went over and unplugged the TV from the wall. You're going to take care of that vegetative state for him. I was thinking about a vegetative state. You know, that would be a sad state to be in especially when it comes to living out the Christian life. See, here's the thing. In today's Christianity, it is really easy to exist in a vegetative state. And I think one of the things that we need to make sure that we do here is encouragement of pulling the plug at dry run. And what we want to think about there in terms of what God says about his church, and being part of his body. We want to call everyone associated with Jesus Christ to get on board and to be a biblical member of this congregation. Now, we understand, as the Bible presents it to us, that all followers of Jesus Christ are members of the universal body of Christ. Jesus didn't say, I've come to build my churches. Jesus said, I've come to build my church, Matthew chapter 16. So every child of God is a member of that one body. But we also acknowledge, and this is vitally important that we get this part, the necessity of every believer to particularly identify with a local manifestation of that body, a local congregation. And that's what we want everyone in this place to do. You know, if someone were to ask me about membership in the body of Christ here at Dry Run, I, I would want to get to the bottom of three questions with them. And let me just go ahead and put those on the screen. First of all, do you acknowledge that Jesus is God's son? He's the only way to heaven because Jesus said that. I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And do you intend to live a life that honors Jesus? The Bible tells us that in different places. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. You know, in all that we do and all that we say, we need to honor Christ. 
And then also, have you placed your faith in Jesus, repented of your sins, turned from sin in your life, and been baptized, uh, as the Bible teaches? Uh, The birthday of the church, in Acts chapter 2, we read about that. Now, if that's you, and you were baptized here, you were automatically added to the body of believers here at Dry Run. Acts chapter 2, verse 47 says, the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And so we do that here. We automatically add you to our body of believers and and your name with us. Now, if that's you, what I've just put on the screen, and you've come to us from another congregation, we invite you to transfer your membership. We like to think of it as your Christian influence to this congregation, to move from being just a guest to becoming an involved family member and saying, letting everybody know, this is where we want to, to worship. This is the family that we want to associate with and the body that we want to be involved in. And if you have any questions about that, you know, please feel free to contact me and get a hold of me. See me after the service. We'll set up a time to get together. I'd be happy to talk to you at your convenience. But it's our hope and prayer that all of us will choose to step on board with the vision and the plan of what God has in mind for his church. Now, here's the thing. I believe we need a new view of belonging to the body of Christ. Here's the thing. Every Christian, every Christ follower is three things. Let's go ahead and bring that up, guys. We're a believer. We believe certain truths about Jesus. We are a becomer. We're hopefully becoming a little bit more like Jesus over the years, the fruit of the Spirit in our life. And then we're a belonger. We are connected to the family of Jesus. As I said earlier, at conversion, Jesus adds every saved person to the universal family of God. But that saved person needs to affiliate with a local representation of that family. And this is how the word church is used most often in the New Testament. For the local visible representation of the body of Christ. You're going to hear that word a lot today, body of Christ. Here in our text in 1 Corinthians 12 in verse 13, it says we're baptized by one spirit as to form one body. And then the end of the passage in verse 27, it says, now you're the body of Christ and each one of you a part of it. By the way, that word body is the most often used metaphor for the church that appears in scripture. In fact, every book in the New Testament between the book of uh, Romans and Revelation was written either to members of a local church, a body of believers in a certain city or place, or those preaching at that church. But you say, I'm a Christian, I just don't have a church home. That's like saying, I'm a hand, I just don't have an arm. Now, the New Testament uses a word to describe this mutual relationship. And you know what the word is? The word is member. Let me give you a couple of verses that talk about this. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. We're fellow citizens with God's people, members of his household. Here's another one, Romans chapter 12, verse 4 and 5. I think this will help us. As each of us has one body with many members, I have a hand, I have an arm, and these members don't all have the same function. It goes on to say this. In Christ, we, though many, form one body, spiritual, speaking the church now, and each member of the church belongs to all the others. He talks about the church as being a body there. Let me say that again. Whenever that word member is used to describe Christians in the church, it always carries with it this idea of being part of a living body. So here's what we need to understand about membership in the church. Membership in the church is organic, not organizational. When you think of organic, something organic, you think about life and you think about growing. Organizational is something different, right? It has nothing to do with just having your name being on some role in a church office. It has everything to do with being connected to a living body. So what we're shooting for here is every member to recommit to biblical membership. Now, if we're going to understand what that means, we're first going to have to eliminate some what we might call institutional views of the church. When you're a member of Christ's church, you're a member of an organism, not an organization. And there's a difference there. Some of you are members of an organization, and that's fine. What must you do to be a member in good standing? Well, you have to do things like this, attend some of the meetings of that organization. You got to keep the rules, you know, at least superficially. And maybe, you know, in that organization, you've got to pay some dues. 
and that makes you a member in good standing. Years ago, I was invited to join an organization that was over in town, and the person called me and talked to me for about 20 minutes about it, and at the end, they mentioned the dues, and it was over $500, I think. And I was thinking, you know, I'm thinking about joining an organization, not donating a kidney here, but maybe you belong to a club or an organization. You show up once in a while, you pay your dues, and you know some of the other members, but maybe you really don't know each other in the sense that you're really connected to anybody there that much. Nobody's necessarily connected to you, and if you're going through a really hard time, maybe no one knows too much about it, but you're a good member, and sadly, that's how many members understand membership in the body of Christ. I show up some, I don't break too many of the rules, I give a little bit to God here, and this explains why so many members can exist for years in what we refer to earlier as a vegetative state in the body. It explains why some can disappear, and you know what? Not too many is aware of it. That doesn't happen in a body, does it? It doesn't. Has your child ever came home from school and you look at them in horror and say, Junior, where's your arm? And they say, I don't know, Mom. I had it when I left. I guess I just put it somewhere. Not going to happen. You notice the loss of a member of the body, but a member of the club can go for months, and nobody's even aware of it. So we need to rethink and reexamine and recommit to this idea of what it means to be a biblical member of the Lord's church. Now, in this passage of Scripture, I've had you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that Jeff read a while ago. The Holy Spirit inspires Paul to get very specific about this. And let me sort of sum it up for you here. Let me give you an overview. Four simple truths. He basically says every person is a part, a part of the body. He says every part of that body has a purpose. Every part of the body of Christ at Dry Run has a purpose. Every person has a partner. In other words, what we're saying there, the church is a family. Someone said it like this one time, and you've known this is true in your life. Shared joy is double the joy when you can share it with someone. Shared sorrow is is sometimes half the sorrow. No one is an island. And then every part has a place. In verse 27, it says, each one of us, not the wealthiest, the smartest, the prettiest, the most athletic, the most popular, but each part has a place. Let me ask you, what would happen if we all committed to a more biblical understanding of true church membership like that? If we stop defining membership as just having a name on a roll in a place where I pay some dues, quote unquote, and started understanding membership as being connected to a living body, there would be some changes that would take place if that took over in our thinking. I I entitled this Membership Matters because I tell you, when it comes to the church, the body of Christ, membership really does matter. So what would be some of the changes? Here would be one of them here. This would lead to us asserting a mutual dependency A mutual dependency. Look at this text again in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 20 and 21. There's many parts, but there's one body. You got a hand, you got an arm, right? The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. Now, remember, he's applying this to the body that we call the church, a spiritual body. So hear me on what I'm about to say. No individual Christian can achieve maximum spiritual health and fruitfulness as a loner. Not if membership means connection to a body. Now, I know a lot of people that try. All over America, people get in their cars, they drive, they sit down in a building, they talk to no one, they connect with no one, they interact with no one, and after sitting and staring at the back of somebody's head for about an hour or so, they get in their car and they go home. But I don't believe that you can achieve maximum spiritual vitality like that or keeping away from the assembly of the body altogether, certainly. I believe that Jesus and Paul maybe know more about spiritual health than I do. Here's one place in Scripture that sort of brings this up. It says about Jesus, he's before all things, in him all things hold together. And then it says this, he's the head of the body, which is the church. Wow. Jesus is the head and the church's body. Now your head and your body are inseparable. That means a Christian not connected to a church family is like, in a sense, an amputated body part. Have you ever met somebody that's lost a finger? Let's say one day the subject comes up in conversation and you say, well, how'd you lose your finger? And the person tells this story about some freak accident at work and then they smile and say, don't worry, I didn't lose my finger. I've still got it. 
And then they proceed to pull this little small container out of their coat, and they're wrapped up in the tissue paper. Uh, you, you, you get the point here? It's not going to be something you want to see. And if you cut your finger off from your body, is it still connected to the head? Is it still useful and vibrant and alive? A finger doesn't have much life apart from the body. And a Christian who cuts himself off from the local body of believers, how is he still in a healthy connection with the head? He's going to have some withering going on spiritually in his life as well. And after 40 years of ministry, I tell you this. I've yet to meet the person who can say, you know, my Christian life, my marriage, my battle against temptation, my spiritual growth is so much better now that I quit the church. And this is the problem of an organizational understanding of membership. It cannot prevent spiritual decay. Members of a body need each other. In fact, God so designed the body to repudiate independence, your physical body. I know that goes against one of our cultural values as Americans, but God doesn't value independence as highly as we do. God has designed the body to reject self-sufficiency. And he wants us to think about that in terms of the spiritual body too. Let me give you an example in terms of how it works physically. You're feeding a baby. Let's say you're feeding that baby Gerber's baby food. It goes down the esophagus, it enters in the stomach, and it's met by the gastric juices, which is part of the greeter's ministry of the body, okay? And Gerber says, it's nice to meet you, and starts to move on, and the juices say, well, we're here to help you. Well, in what way? To help acclimate you to the baby's body, to absorb and involve you into the body. And Gerber says, no, we don't want that. We want to keep our own identity. And the juices say, no, that's not the way it works in the body. Everyone in the body becomes a part of the body, contributes to the body. But Gerber says, no, no, we don't want to get involved. We want to keep our independence. And they go back and forth for a while until finally the gastric juices say, you don't understand. You have to become part of this body or you have to leave. And if Gerber's refuses, what happens? Gerber's gets disfellowshipped all over mommy's shirt, right? And that baby. And God's designed the physical body to repudiate independence and self-sufficiency as well as the spiritual body. If we're members in good standing in the body of Christ, we'll be interacting and depending on each other too. Here's something that's fascinating to me. 59 times in the New Testament, the command one another is given. 59 times that we're to be responsible in some way to one another, honor one another, love one another, serve one another. There's this mutual dependency. And so I think about it in this, how can I be the best I can be in this regard? Think of the word best, B-E-S-T. The Bible says, bear one another's burdens. So is there a heavy load that I can help carry? It says, encourage one another, the letter E. So is there a word of encouragement I can give to somebody that, I, that needs it for me in the body of Christ? Serve one another. It, as I look around in the body of Christ, is there a need that I can help meet? And then talk to God about one another. Is there a problem I need to pray for from some brother and sister in Christ? When we do those kind of things, this idea of mutual dependency and strength becomes a blessing in the body of Christ. The church, in some ways, is like a jigsaw puzzle. You know, you got all the pieces connected. You've worked a jigsaw, all the pieces connected together. I would even do that with a little grandson, Brady, and I even have trouble with those little 10-piece jigsaw puzzles. The pieces are that big, you know, and where's this go? And I, I try to get it in my mind before we take it out and then try to put it back together, and he usually gets it back together before I do, but there's not one piece of a jigsaw puzzle that's out here by itself dancing the jig, okay? And each piece of the puzzle has been designed purposely. Sometimes I'll just throw out rotten jokes to see if there's still anybody still with me. And unfortunately today I found out the answer is in the negative. But each piece of the puzzle has been designed to have its place. And since each piece of that jigsaw puzzle has been designed, there's no such thing as an insignificant piece to the puzzle. Every piece counts. In fact, it takes the entire puzzle to reveal the completed picture. Have you ever been working on a jigsaw puzzle and you get down and you can't find, there's one or two pieces you can't find, what happened to it? You look under the table, can you look under the chair, you look under the puzzle itself, and when there is a piece missing, there's like an empty feeling, right? 
God's putting together his puzzle, his church, his family, and there's a hole left when you're not there. You're one piece of a picture that's incomplete without you. It's time to get connected. And as the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, be devoted to one another in love. I tell you what, as we understand what this passage is saying about the church, it will also lead to affirming spiritual equality. This is a great principle, this idea of spiritual equality. Look at this passage again. Look at verse 13. We're all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, the church, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, we're all given the one spirit to drink. We all have the same Holy Spirit from God, regardless of our social standing, our, our, our physical appearance, whatever it is. And look at verse 24. Can God's put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, the church, but that its parts should have, notice, equal concern for one another. Equal concern for each other. There's an issue of the National Geographic magazine a few years ago that contained an article about what we call the pygmy people of Africa. And these small people have a unique way of making and reinforcing their social bonds, making music and reinforcing those bonds. The men whittle musical pipes out of soft wood, but what is unique is that each pipe is de designed only to play one single note. It might be a B flat, it might be the, uh, 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 an F sharp or an A flat, and when they come together, they can play beautiful music because each person's contribution is necessary. If a few remain independent, if a few don't come together, the richness and the harmony of the music is distorted, and that's how it is in the body of Christ. In the church, no member is considered, this is beautiful, no member is cons considered any less important than any other member in the church. Galatians chapter 3 verse 28 puts it like this. There's neither Jew nor Gentile or slave or free or male or female. You're all one in Christ. Now, it's not talking about physically. We know there's differences physically. There's different roles physically. But spiritually speaking, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. See, that's always been the great hallmark of the church. Where else can you find so many different kinds of people caring for one another and, and enjoying each other? The church ought to look like the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles. Think about it. You go to the DMV and you're immediately confronted with an immense cross-section of people and a crazy variety of vehicles. You ever had to stand in line over there? And you look out in the parking lot, where else can you go and find the owner of a brand new Mercedes getting his registration right alongside a rather disheveled person? driving a 1999 Ford Escort with a bag of week-old fries and a crusty cheeseburger growing penicillin in the back seat. They're both in the same line, right? The church is like a spiritual DMV. Now, that's not true in a club. I can guarantee in just about every club, some members are more important than other members. It may be in the way they dress or the, who sits at the head of the table or whatever it is. But in the body, the less visible members are absolutely critical to the well-being of the body. Those parts of my body you can't see that work out of sight, you know what, are absolutely indispensable to my future health. And that's the way it is in the church. My dad recently had a heart attack. He's doing better now. He's out of the hospital. But in the body, you have both a hand and you have a heart. The hand you can see, the heart you can't see. But I think we'd all agree, the heart's pretty important. In the church, you have hand gifts, the ones you can see, they're up front, they're teaching, whatever it is, and you have heart gifts behind the scene. And I thank God for all the heart gifts here at Dry Run. So what I would do with this spiritual equality, here's the thing, in Scripture, with privilege, there always comes a part for me to play. With rights, there's always responsibilities. Remember what we said at the beginning, the privilege is, in the church, every person is a part. The responsibility is every part of the body has a purpose. I'm going to say more about that in a minute, but let me put it like this for right now. Spiritual equality means equal accountability. Let me say that again. Spiritual equality carries with it equal accountability. For instance, is it any more important that I represent this church family well in the community than you doing that yourself? Is it more important that I support this congregation with my tithes and offering than you doing that? Is it any more important that I get up here and preach from here than you get involved in the ministry out there? Spiritual equality equals accountability. 
in the body, all members are needed, all members are valued, all members are cherished. This is why you see in a body, unlike a club, the activities of one member concerns the rest. Did you know that? When someone does something that gives a black eye to the church, it affects the whole church. When somebody does something that is a positive, uh, uh, encouraging thing in the community out here, it, it, it brings uh, honor to Jesus in this place. Let's say you're pounding a nail and you slip and slam that ha- hammer down on your thumb. Now, you don't consider your thumb to be the most important part of your body, do you? If I had to choose between losing a lung and losing a thumb, there'd be no discussion, right? But if you slam your thumb with a hammer, the rest of your body is going to respond as if the thumb is the most important part of your body. The arm will begin to shake, right? The feet will begin to, 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 to sort of to hop. The face will begin to scowl. The eyes might begin to moisten. The brain will shout, help the thumb, help the thumb, hold the thumb. And you're reaching over like this. And I tell you what, even the tongue and the mouth get involved, but we're not going to go there, right? The whole body bums with the thumb. That's the difference in the membership in a body and the membership in the club. To, To change the word picture, to go back to that idea of those musical instruments, unless we all play our notes, the music in this place just isn't as beautiful. And I tell you what else this will all lead to when you think about the church as a body. This will lead to each of us accepting personal responsibility. Look at this passage again in verse 18. He says, God has placed. Why has God done that? For a reason, for a purpose, for a function. The parts in the body, every one of them, just as he's wanted them to be. Now you're the body of Christ. Each one of you is a part of it. Let's say while you're driving to town tomorrow to go to the bank or whatever it is, your eye sees a traffic light and the sensors in the eye perceive that the color of the light is red. So your brain checks my memory bank and announces the meaning of a red light to the right foot, right? My right foot responds by leaving the accelerator and pressing the brake. But what if my body doesn't function properly? What if my eye decides not to be a part of the body because the nose hurt its feelings? Or what if the foot is tired of being bossed around and decides to press the gas pedal instead of the brake? Or what if the right foot's in pain but too proud to tell the left foot so the left foot doesn't know when to step in and help? In all all those instances, insurance premiums are going to go up, right? Because you're going to have a meet and greet between your front bumper and uh, Bubba's uh, trunk that's been in front of you here. You see, if as a member of the body, I don't do my part, the whole body's affected, and there's something wrong with my connection to the head. Here's how the Bible puts it. Wow, this is a powerful passage of Scripture. Ephesians chapter 4, it goes like this. We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. It's talking about the church. And it goes on to say, from him, the whole body joined and held together. Now notice, by every supporting ligament, that's you, grows and builds itself up in love as how many parts? Each part does its work. How many times have you seen a report of one of the biggest problems today in America is obesity? Now, I've read just about every New Testament passage about this metaphor of the body as a church, and I found references to hands, to feet, to eyes, to ears, even to ligaments right here. But I've never found one to body fat. New Testament doesn't talk about the church in terms of body fat. God intends for no one in the body, the family of God, to exist in a vegetative state, just being lugged around by the rest of the body. And so we all have a personal responsibility to pursue what is biblical and not what just is comfortable. So let me ask this question. I need to constantly keep asking myself this question. Let's go ahead and put it up there. How healthy would this church body be if everyone here practiced my kind of membership? You know, we think about phones, the advertisement for phones. Phones going 5G, the 5G network. Here's 5G in the body of Christ. First of all, we need to gather. We need to have a commitment to gather, to be committed to weekly worship together on the first day of the week with other members of the body. Secondly, grow. In other words, we have to grow habits into our life that will help us to grow spiritually. Those habits are things like getting into God's word daily, God's regular Bible study with him, and prayer into our life. Thirdly, groups. 
we got to get together with other Christians, maybe become part of one of these core classes, or later in the year, our 3C groups, or maybe it's going out together too and developing community with another couple and fellowshipping together, whatever it is, for giving of our first and our best to God. Whether or not the building's been paid off should not affect how you give to God. It's part of a spiritual practice and discipline of gratitude in our life for God. It's an act of worship. When Sherry and I go away on vacation, when we come back, we want to make sure that we make up what we missed in the, the Sunday we weren't there. We wanted God to go with us on vacation. We're glad and thankful that God uh, blessed us while we're gone, and that's an act of gratitude when we come back. It's just part of our spiritual discipline and practice, and we need to make that, each and every one of us, the same. And then go with your faith outside these walls. Take Jesus with you into your home, into your job, your school. See, you're a chosen people, the Bible says. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. So you can proclaim the praises of him who's called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Privilege and responsibility right there. Boy, you know what? A chosen people of God, that's the privilege. Responsibility, a royal priesthood. Don't think of what you think of in terms of a priest today. Back in the Bible times, there were priests that represented the people before God in the temple in the Old Testament, and then they would offer sacrifices on behalf of the people. So spiritually speaking, today in the church, we're all priests. And what that means is this. Every Christian has direct access to God through Jesus Christ. That's the privilege. We don't have to go through any other person to get to God. We don't have to go and have somebody sit behind a curtain and make a confession to them. We just go through Jesus Christ. And secondly, every Christian can and should offer sacrifices to God. That's the responsibility. All of us, each and every one of us, have God-honoring, body-building offerings to bring before him. Our time, our talent, our treasure. God calls us into this body, places us into it, and he says, now here's a privilege, but live out now the responsibility. Don't you love it when Jesus taught in Scripture, he would use the common things of life, he, and everyday things. A sower went out to sow some seed, and he would say something like this, consider the lilies of the field, the flowers. Sometimes he talked about birds. And I was thinking about that the other day when I saw Geese flying in a V formation. Isn't that a beautiful thing when you see that? You know, according to studies, they fly in that formation because they can fly 71% further than a single goose can by himself. Now, how did those geese figure that out? Did one of them graduate, you know, get their degree from MIT and aeronautical engineering and say, okay, guys, we fly in this formation, we go further. No, God designed them. God made them that way. God made you and me to be connected with one another. And, you know, there's some people that think the church is for the birds. But the same is true for us. We can be more, we can do more when we join together than when we're individuals. Geese fly together because it makes the journey easier. And we're the church because when we're together going in the same direction, we benefit from each other's lives and we're blessed. If you ever see a skein of geese like that flying overhead, listen carefully, and you'll hear a lot of honking going on. You've noticed that, right? Many uh, bird experts believe the honking is a form of audible encouragement that the geese are giving each other. We don't know what they're saying. It may be, you know, some young goose saying how much further, you know, you know, maybe it's mother goose telling stories. I don't know. Perhaps it's wife goose saying, don't you dare pass another exit without stopping. I, I don't know. But maybe they're just saying, keep it up. Keep going. Let's go. It's a long journey. Keep flapping. And the Christian life's a long journey too. And we can't make it unless we have people encouraging us. It could be the only honk that you hear this week is the guy behind you. As soon as that light turns green in a half a second and they honk a horn and you're on your way to Walmart. But wouldn't it be great if we decided we're all going to get behind Jesus and do our part and take our place and start encouraging one another to keep on keeping on. Don't quit. Keep on being faithful as we sail to heaven's shore together. Remember what we said a few minutes ago? Every person's a part. Every part of the body has a purpose. Every person in the body of Christ has a partner. We have one another, and every part has a place. That's the church Jesus died for, and there's nothing on earth like it. And that V formation, that stands for victory. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, thanks be to God. He gives us what? The victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. Father.